All right, this is chapter 15, Respiratory System AMP. We're going to start on your slides on, on slide four with the structural plan. Um, the overview starts in your book. Um, I guess it's different for your book since you guys have got different editions. Um, but on chapter 15 at the very beginning, it starts talking about what the respiratory system looks like. And we're going to look at that on the next slide as well. But the overview says the basic plan of the respiratory system would be similar to an inverted tree. So an upside down tree. So that would mean that the tree trunk would be up here and the branches would come down. And that's basically what our respiratory system looks like as well. And we'll talk about the anatomy of it in just a little while. It says... If the tree were hollow, leaves of the tree would be compared to the alveoli with the microscopic sacs enclosed by networks of capillaries. Passive transport process of diffusion is responsible for the exchange, in, the exchange of gases and occur during respiration. That's very important to remember. The diffusion, okay, remember if you guys remember what diffusion means. Um, diffusion means the movement of particles back and forth. So... We're going to talk about how there's an exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. And I know we've talked about it a little bit before with the capillaries um, in your cardiovascular system, but we're going to discuss it again more in depth for the respiratory system. Your next slide is the picture that you have on figure 15-1. <laughs> and you can see what in <coughs> all the structures of the respiratory system, starting with the nasal cavity. All right. And that would be called your upper respiratory tract. You'll need to know the difference. Um, and what is in the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. Upper respiratory, you see your nasal cavity. So remember when we were tracing a drop of blood in the cardiac system? So this time I kind of want you to picture tracing a breath of air. So when we breathe in either our nose or our mouth, if we're going breathing in through our nose, it's going to go gut down your nasopharynx, nasopharynx being the tube. If I breathe in my mouth, it's going to go past my oropharynx, all right? So we're going to say... The nasal cavity, taking a breath. It's going to come into our nares or our nostrils, into our nasal cavity, down the nasopharynx, oropharynx next, because remember our nose comes before our mouth. So nasopharynx, then oropharynx, and then laryngeopharynx, where our larynx is, our voice box, okay? The nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngeopharynx are all considered the pharynx itself, just subdivisions. After the pharynx, we're going to get to the larynx, which is the voice box. And then we're going to hit the trachea. And the trachea is pretty strong. And you can see by that picture, it looks like it has little rings around it. And those little rings are to make it bendy a little bit, but to give it strength. So we go from our trachea, and then we're going to branch out. All right, now our trunk is starting to branch out. And when it branches out, we're going to hit the left and the right primary bronchi the bigger of the bronchi until we get smaller and smaller and smaller, just like our blood vessels, we're going to go from bronchi to bronchioles, all right? And then from the bronchioles, we're going to see little leaves coming off of it, and those little leaves are going to be called the alveoli. And those are those little sacs that where we have the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and they're very important. And you can see right there, it's got a little bit of an up-close view of what the alveoli, al alveoli look like when they branch off of the bronchioles. And you can see how they're covered in capillaries. And what do we know about capillaries? Capillaries are where diffusion takes place. So where I drop off good stuff and pick up bad stuff. So that is the structural plan of the respiratory system in a nutshell. The next slide, we're going to be talking about the upper respiratory tract again. This is a good one. We just really talked about them as a matter, a matter of fact, but you have to remember what's in the upper respiratory tract and what's in the lower because you might have a doctor that says they've diagnosed you with an upper respiratory infection. Well, that's kind of like um, your sinuses or um, you have laryngitis or something like that. And then lower respiratory tract would be your trachea, your bronchial tree, and your lungs. Your bronchial tree being your, bronchi your bronchi, your bronchioles, down into your lungs where all the little alveoli live. Respiratory mucosa is on, I keep wanting to say a page, but you guys have different books. In your book, it says, before beginning the study of individual organs in the respiratory system, it is important to review the histology or the microscopic anatomy of the respiratory mucosa. 
the membrane that lines most of the air distribution tubes in the system. So if I was to be able to put my finger down my throat all the way into this area, it would still be a moist um, material, mm -hmm, like the inside of my mouth, all right? Still wet, still um, easy to, um, soft to the touch. It says respiratory mucosa is typically ciliated pseudostratified epithelium. Remember, pseudostratified means that it looks like there's many layers, but there's really not. And that one layer is connected to a basement membrane so that it doesn't, it, so that it's got a good firm foundation. And we know that those cells can produce mucus. All right, remember, those things are attached to the, the pseudostratified, pseudostratified epithelium um, have the mucus producing abilities and that's very important for our respiratory tract because mucus is protective and so if we inhale a bunch of stuff that mucus is designed to help us get it out of the trachea <coughs> and remember cilia are those little hairs all right hairs that move one direction and those hairs are also there for me to help expel things that should not be in my respiratory tract it says as its name applies this type of tissue is covered with cilia Look back at figure three, four, if we need to look at cilia, but I think that's all you need to know. And we talked about the mucus. Mucus not only is protective, but it also helps to, um, uh, well, that's about it. But when I breathe into the right respiratory tract with the help of mucus, it also kind of humidifies my, um, the breath that I take in, and it does so much for purification. We need that mucus because it's very protective. The next slide, slide eight, talks about the function of the cilia. And, of course, we've just talked about that. So they move one way. You know, they don't go back and forth like this. So they're constantly pushing irritants out of the lungs. The next slide, slide nine, um, just a little bit of what we had talked about one of the early chapters about goblet cells and those goblet cells being attached to that basement membrane. And it says over to the side, pseudostratified epithelium. And again, I'm going to say it again. Pseudostratified means that it looks like multiple layers of cells, but it's only one. All right, see how the nuclei of all those cells make it look like there's so many different cells. But in, in reality, it's one cell connected to a basement membrane all the way up. And then the next one right beside it. All right, and remember that those kind of cells have the goblet cells in it. And when I see the word goblet cells, I know that those cells produce mucus. And that's what we're talking about, the protective mucus that is in our respiratory tract. Slide 10, uh, the structure of the nose. We're going to flip until we find that. Uh, under respiratory tract. All right, so the nose, we also call the nares. It says air enters the respiratory tract through the external nares, all right, or the nostrils, those thingies. And then it flows into the right and left nasal cavities, which are lined by respiratory mucosa, which we've talked about. The partition called the nasal septum separates these two cavities. The surface of the nasal cavities is moist from mucus and warm from blood flowing just under it. Nerve endings responsible for a sense of smell which is your olfactory receptors, are also located in the nasal mucosa. There are four sets of paranasal sinuses. You'll need to know those, and we've talked about those before. You've got frontal, you've got maxillary, you've got sphenoid, which is kind of in the back, sitting at the base of your brain, and you've got ethmoid. They're kind of like here, and they kind of go backwards, all right? So those are important to know. And remember, sinuses are like caverns. They're kind of empty. All right, unless I get sick and then they're full of mucus because my body's working overtime to try to rid itself of the antigen or of the whatever is in there trying to get it out. All right, but normally they are kind of hollow. All right, now it talks about sinusitis in there. And sinusitis, anytime I have anything that ends with the word itis, we know it's inflammation. And sinus, sinusitis is usually inflammation and possibly even infection of the material that makes up the inner lining of the sinus cavities. It says symptoms of sinusitis include pressure, pain, headache, and often external tenderness. So that means I might be tender right through here, might be tender through here. Wherever I've got sinuses, I could be tender. And normally, a doctor might come up and put, you know, or does this hurt or does this hurt? And he'll see if they're tender there to try to confirm uh, the diagnosis of sinusitis. 
It says treatment includes decongestants, analgesics, which means something for pain, antibiotics if it's a bacterial infection, in some cases surgery to improve drainage. <coughs> the two ducts from the lacrimal sacs also drain into the nasal cavity. Remember, lacrimal sacs are like, okay, where you have the tears that form. But those lacrimal sacs will also drain into my sinuses as well. And I think that's probably why a lot of times when we cry, we get all snotty, all right? Note in figure 15-4 that three shelf-like structures called the conche protrude into the nasal cavity on each side. The nasal conche are sometimes called the nasal turbinates, and typically we call them turbinates. The mucosa covering the conche greatly increase the surface area for which air must flow as it passes through the nasal cavities. As air moves over the conche and through the nasal cavities, it is warmed and humidified. Um, there's a good picture on 15.4. Uh, let's see here. Slide 11 is showing you your four sets of parasinuses. And I don't think you have... Oh, yeah, we're almost down there. All right. Um, if your slide 13 has a really good picture of what the conche look like or the turbinates all right they kind of look like little meaty air ducts and as that air passes over them it's warmed um so when it hits the back of your neck and goes down then it's not so cold all right go back up to figure to slide 10 um i think we talked about all that one in the nose 11 is your paranasal sinuses uh your upper respiratory tract we'll go back to that one from 13 your pharynx, uh, your pharynx, it says, is about five inches long, and it's divided into those three areas we talked about earlier. The part that's right beside your nose being the nasopharynx, or excuse me, behind. The part right behind your oral cavity is the oral pharynx. <coughs> and the area that lies just above your larynx is the laryngeopharynx. Um, it says the two nasal cavities, mouth, esophagus, larynx, and auditory tubes all have openings into the pharynx, so we can all drain into there. Pharyngeal tonsils and openings of the auditory tubes open into the nasopharynx. Tonsils found in the oral pharynx and mucous membranes line the pharynx. Now, those last two bullet points you probably don't need a whole lot of. That's just the anatomy part, so... Um, it does talk about, under the pharynx, your auditory tubes or your eustachian tubes. You've probably heard them as eustachian tubes more often. Um, it does talk about there how it opens into the nasopharynx, and they connect the middle ears with the nasopharynx, and that's why a lot of times when you have a stopped-up nose, you also have stopped-up ears because they connect. It says this connection permits the equalization of air pressure between the middle and the external ear. So if I'm stopped up, I can't equalize and I get all dizzy. Okay. Um, I'll skip in a little bit more. It talks about the masses of lymphoid tissue called your tonsils. We talked about that just in the last chapter. The lingual tonsils and the palatine tonsils are located at the oral pharynx because they're at the base of my tongue and right at the back. And then the pharyngeal tonsils, which are the ones that are in the upper part, are your adenoids. Um, are located in the nasopharynx. And if you can remember the anatomy for those, you should be just fine. Um, it talks a little bit about tonsillitis, and of course that's inflammation of your tonsils. You get tonsillitis too much, and they'll take your tonsils out. All right, so going back to slide 13 where we looked at the conche, um, it's a really good side view of the upper airways. Uh, pretty good of the upper respiratory system. And slide 14, uh, we're going to talk about the larynx, um, which is where we um, have your vocal cords. So we call that the voice box. So let's find larynx in your book. It says the larynx or the voice box is located just below the pharynx. It is composed of nine pieces of cartilage. And we know cartilage is strong and a little bit movable. You know the largest part of these, and that is the Adam's apple. Two short fibrous bands called the vocal cords stretch across the inferior of the larynx. So if I was to take an ET tube or endotracheal tube and try to go down, you would have to pass through your larynx. And I would visualize that because I would see those little bands of the vocal cords. It looked like two little rubber bands pulling down right over it. And you could probably heard in TV shows, visualize the, the vocal cords and you'll go right between them with the tube. And it really does look like that. I don't think you have a picture in the book. Oh, you do. You do. You do. It's on the next page. 
a picture of the vocal cords. It's really neat. Um, let's see here. Muscles that attach to the larynx cartilages can pull on these cords in such a way that they become tense or relaxed. And that, I can do that. All right. Those are things that I can do to tense and relax those vocal cords. I get different movement in there and I can make my voice do different things. When they are tense, the voice is high pitched, and when they are relaxed, the, the voice is low pitched. And the space between the vocal cords is the glottis. Now we're getting to things, all this stuff is very important, of course, but the glottis is very important as well. We're going to talk about the epiglottis. Another cartilage is called the epiglottis, and it partially covers the opening of the larynx. The epiglottis is a trapdoor closing off the larynx. Your epiglottis is hugely important. Because if it did not shut off the larynx, then I would get choked on things I'm trying to swallow. All right. So it says it closes off the larynx during swallowing and prevents food and liquid from entering the trachea. My esophagus and my trachea, my trachea sits up front, my esophagus sits behind it. And when I swallow, my epiglottis shuts off the larynx so the food can go down this way. All right. Now, there are things, problems we can have with the epiglottis, like epiglottitis, that means it's inflamed. And it would swell up, and that way it would not work correctly. So, And that happens to children a lot. And sometimes, well, when anything gets swollen in the neck, I get worried about it cutting off my air supply. All right? So that would concern me. But when it gets swollen, too, like that, it can't flap back and forth, and I'm easily choked. <coughs> All right. The next slide, you see a picture of the larynx, and there's your picture of the vocal cords. The lower respiratory tract, starting with the trachea. Uh, the trachea is your windpipe. It says in your book it's about four and a half inches long, and it extends from the larynx into the thoracic cavity. All right, remember your thoracic cavity is about right here. So your your trachea, um, you can feel your trachea. You know, you can kind of push in there. Um, you know, you know you're doing something wrong because it doesn't feel right when you push on it, right? But your trachea goes right down through here, and of course our bronchioles are eventually going to branch off from that but our trachea comes down into here um it has a mucus lining which is very important all right we uh, we need that mucus lining for protection to get irritants out and we talked a little bit of, a while ago how it has the rings and it says it has c-shaped rings of cartilage to hold the trachea open and those rings are pretty tough all right it allows for movement of course yeah i can do this it allows for movement but they're very tough and it keeps my trachea from closing in on itself all right I don't know if you guys have ever seen Roadhouse, but you know when he goes in and he grabs the trachea and pulls it out. I don't even know if that's possible, but I definitely could get hard hit hard enough in the trachea where it could collapse. Right. The function of the trachea is a passageway for air to move to and from the lungs. So it's it's the tube that's getting air from here to down to here where the magic happens. All right, where the oxygen carbon dioxide is exchanged. An obstruction, a blockage of the trachea includes the airway. All right, it's the major airway getting everything from here to here. So, of course, if it's blocked, it's over, right? I'll have a loss of oxygen because nothing can exchange down here. So, I'll build up CO2 and I'll lose O2 and then I will eventually perish from this earth, all right? Uh, tracheal obstruction causes more than 4,000 deaths annually in the United States. There's lots of ways that you can be obstructed in the trachea. You could have something go down the wrong way, right? It could be food, um uh, you could have swelling in the trachea. You could go in through anaphylaxis, which would close up your airway. All of these things are considered an obstruction. Your next slide is a cross-section of the trachea, and it gives you a good idea of how far the trachea come down. And you see on the left-hand side as the trachea is coming down, it will eventually branch off into your primary bronchi, which is the largest opening of your bronchial tubes. And it shows you over to the side what happens during breathing, which is pretty neat. I don't think I've seen that picture before. Your lower respiratory tract continued. Now we're going from the bronchial tree. Now we're leaving the trachea with our breath of air, and we're going to separate off into two primary bronchi, the right and the left, of course. Each bronchus branches into smaller little tubes. Remember how we went from arteries to arterioles to capillaries and all that good stuff? Well, my bronchi are going to do that as well, and they're going to start branching off into tiny, smaller little areas called bronchioles, all right? And that's the next thing there. It says bronchioles end with little clusters of alveolar sacs. It's almost like, just like a tree almost. My trunk has come down. I've got bigger branches going into smaller branches, and on those smaller branches, I've got little 
I always think of it as little cluster of grapes, all right? A little tiny alveolar sacs. And these alveolar sacs are when my oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange is going to happen. The function of my bronchial tree, of course, is air distribution from one lung to the other lung, all right? For go right lung into left lung. And for passageway for air to move to and from the alveoli. My alveoli are my end game. That's where I need all of the air to get to because that's where I'm going to make that exchange. All right. Now, your alveoli. Very important. Well, everything's important. I keep saying that. This is where the exchange of gases happen. All right. Between the air and the blood. And we're going to do that by diffusion. And remember, diffusion is the movement of particles. And we're going to be moving particles of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay. That's the biggest ones we're going to move. Your next slide shows uh, the bronchioles and how they go down into little sacs of alveoli. And you can see each little sac is called an alveolar sac. Each little grape looking thing is an alveolar. And when you look inside of those, you're gonna see the alveolar ducts. And ducts kind of mean the same thing like duct work in your house would mean. Slide 20 is the alveolus and the respiratory membrane. And it kind of shows us what happens when we take a breath of air. Now, you can see little areas right there that are purple that says surfactant producing type 2 cells. Surfactant is a slippery material that my body makes to keep my alveoli stay open. All right. So, if I don't have enough of that surfactant in my lungs, then my alveoli will collapse. I don't want my alveoli to collapse because then they don't work. And I need them all to work because I want to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, under alveoli in your book, it talks about the respiratory membrane. It says, this, where are we at? First, the wall of each alveolus is made up of a single layer of simple squamous epithelial cells. Thin, okay? And so are the walls of the capillaries that surround and lie in contact with them. And does this picture, it's not great at showing that. A little bit. But you can see the capillaries around there. See how close they're laying on the alveoli? And remember, capillaries, think it back to your cardiovascular system, capillaries are where we exchange waste and oxygen in the tissues, all right? Now, we're in the lung tissue, we're in exchanging carbon dioxide and oxygen, so you can see how those little capillaries lay right up against the alveoli, and that's how diffusion is going to work, it's where it's going to take place. So, what my capillary wall is made up is very thin, and my, and my excuse me, my alveoli wall is very thin, and my capillary wall is very thin. <laughs> it says this means that the that between the blood and the capillaries and in the air in each alveolus, there is a barrier less than one micron thick, super duper thin. This extremely thin layer is called the respiratory membrane. <coughs> it says second, there are millions of alveoli. This means that together they make an enormous surface. The total surface area of all the alveoli together is approximately 84 square meters. <laughs> Skip into the next paragraph. The surface of the respiratory membrane inside each alveoli is covered by a substance called surfactant. That's that stuff that we need, our body needs to make, to keep our alveoli open and working. Surfactant helps reduce surface tension or stickiness of the watery mucus inside the alveoli, keeping the alveoli from collapsing. Okay, so now we know that they're saying, you see the little box on the inside of that uh, diagram or that picture on slide 20. And you can see how when my capillary is butted up against that alveoli, that exchange through that membrane of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And that happens because both of the walls of each structure are very, very thin. So then I can use diffusion to get the oxygen and the carbon dioxide back and forth where it needs to go. Super cool. Uh, lower respiratory tract continued on the next slide. We're talking about the lungs. It says the lungs are fairly large organs. They have deep grooves called fissures that subdivide each lung into lobes. The right lung has three lobes and the left lung has two lobes. So the side that your heart is on, we only have two lobes. All right. They're very large. All right, they fill most of my chest cavity up except for the middle space, which my heart has in it. And they have large blood vessels, and they need that because I need the nutrients to get there to keep the tissue alive. In your book, it says the narrow superior position of each lung up under the collarbone is the apex. And the broad inferior portion resting on the diaphragm is the base. So the lower end, the bottom part of your lung is the base. Um, let's see here. The pleura. 
Okay, we've talked about pleura before. Pleura is the moist, smooth, slippery membrane that lines the chest cavity and covers the outer surface of the lungs. Remember when we had the girls stand up there and we put a, pretend like we put a sheet of saran wrap over Shelby and then back up over Molly. And that is the pleura. One side goes to this chest cavity and then it wraps up over the lungs. And that is going to um, cover the surface of the lungs to protect them. And that reduces the friction between the lungs and the chest wall. So every time I take a breath, my lungs don't automatically grind up against my chest wall. There's two pieces of pleura that rub together and a, a little bit of slippery material that keep it from rubbing really hard and causing problems. That makes breathing much easier. Of course, the function of my lungs are to house my alveoli where all of the magic happens. All the magic. All right. um, down below in that same paragraph, it talks about pleurisy. And we just talked about the pleura, you know, that slippery sheet of material that covers the the inside of my thoracic cavity and over my lungs and we talked about the slipperiness of it well sometimes that can get inflamed and i'll call that pleurisy and so pleurisy hurts every time you take a breath because that pleura is inflamed every time you take a breath there's quite a bit of pain it also talks in your book about a pneumothorax it says a pneumothorax is the presence of air in the intrapleural space on one side of the chest so if there gets air trapped for some reason between my lung and my pleural sac, okay, the pleura that covers my lungs, then it's going to push in on my lung and not make breathing so easy. And sometimes you can have such a big pneumothorax, a big a collection of air between my lung and that pleura, that it pushes my lung in so far that the lung collapses. So people have to go in a lot of times if it's bad enough and release that air. Slide 23 shows you a pretty good picture of the lungs and the pleura. <coughs> and you can see how it's very thin and that the lung fills up most of the, th the thoracic cavity. So if we did not have that pleura there, every time we took a breath, it would just rub up against the inside of our thorax. And remember, you've got parietal pleura, which is the side of the pleura that is next to the thoracic cavity. And you've got the visceral pleura, which is up next to the lungs. Respiration means the exchange of gases between a living organism and environment. So when I say respiration, you're actually exchanging carbon dioxide and um, oxygen. Okay. Um, that is, I keep trying to give you a page number and I can't do that. Um, so the exchange is actually called respiration. External respiration is pulmonary ventilation, breathing, and pulmonary gas exchange. I don't even see that that says a whole lot in your book. Let me look. Yes, it does. It's over to the side. It says breathing or the pulmonary ventilation is the process that moves air into in and out of the lungs. It makes possible that the exchange of gases between the air and lungs and in the blood. Together, these processes are called external respiration. Respiration. All right. So the actual exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen again. Now, to ventilate just means to push air in, all right? So, I can push air in. When, when someone's on a ventilator, they're just pushing air into the lung, all right? So, if I was to respirate, though, then that means that I'm caught, I am actually having an exchange of those two materials, the carbon dioxide and the oxygen. Just to push air into someone's lungs is to ventilate, but to respirate means to have that exchange. <coughs> Below, it talks about internal respiration. It says, in addition, exchange of gases occur between the blood and the cells of the systemic tissues of the body. That's out in the body now, okay? Systemic tissues, which then use the oxygen and the biochemical pathways that transfer energy from nutrients into molecules of ATP. Together, these processes are called internal respiration. The term cellular respiration refers to the use of oxygen by the cells, all right? So we're talking about everything out of the respiratory system. When I use oxygen and I have that exchange out in my tissues, all right, remember we talked about the cardiovascular system, when I'm actually exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide out in my tissues, it is called cellular respiration, okay? When I have um, breathing at here, you know, when I'm doing the exchange in my respiratory tract, we're going to call that um, your pulmonary ventilation and the respiration, your next slide shows a little bit about respiration, how when we take a breath in, um, the exchange down all the way down to the alveolus. 
actually that's a pretty good little picture all right pulmonary ventilation inspiration is the movement of air into the lungs um, the active process is just pushing it in um, inspiratory muscles including the diaphragm and external intercostals so let's go to your book all right Pulmonary ventilation, or breathing, has two phases. The inspiration, or inhaling, which is pushing the air into the lungs, the ventilation part we were talking about, and the expiration, or exhalation, moving the, the words out, the, excuse me, the air out. So ventilation is just taking air in and moving air out. That's ventilation. Remember, respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, it says, in the lungs are enclosed within the thoracic cavity. The exchange, the changes in the shape and size of the thoracic cavity result in the changes in air pressure within the cavity. This can get a little confusing. And in the lungs, this difference in the air pressure is the driving force of movement of air into and out of the lungs. Air moves from an area where pressure is high into an area where pressure is lower. Anything that flows, whether it is blood, lymph, or air, follows the primary principle a fluid always flows down a pressure gradient so it's what we're saying here is it's much harder for me to take a breath in than it is to relax and put it take a breath in or take a breath out all right so while you're sitting there take a big deep breath in take some energy and then to let it out you just have to relax <coughs> and cough <coughs> it kind of forces itself out so, it does follow the path of least resistance. It's easier to push it out. Okay. Um, let's see here. Going on for inspiration. Wait, actually, where are we at? Inspiration now. It says, inspiration occurs when the chest cavity enlarges. So, when I take a breath in, my chest cavity opens up and gets a little bit bigger. As the thoracic, as the thorax enlarges, the lungs expand along with it. And the air rushes into them and down into the alveoli. This happens because of a very important law of physics. The volume and pressure of a gas are inversely proportional. That means that when the volume of gas goes up, the lung volume goes up and we expand the thorax. Just like blowing up a balloon. <laughs> and then in the thorax, the pressure goes down. Okay. Thus, air pressure in the lungs decreases during inspiration. When air pressure in the lungs is less than air, as, as, at, atmospheric pressure, if I can talk, air rushes down its pressure gradient into the lungs. Muscles that increase the volume of the thorax are classified as inspiratory muscles. So when I breathe in, I'm taking an inspiration and I use inspiratory muscles. That includes the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. And the intercostal muscles are the ones that are in between your ribs. The diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle separating the abdominal cavity from the thorax, and we've talked about that before. The diaphragm flattens out when it contracts during inspiration. So when I take a breath in, my diaphragm flattens. And when I, take, when I exhale or take an expiration, then it goes back up to dome shape. Um, let's see here. The diaphragm is the dome shape. The diaphragm flattens out when I in, take an inspiration. Instead of protruding up into the chest cavity as it does at rest, it moves downwards into the abdominal cavity as it contracts. Thus, the contraction or flattening of the diaphragm makes the chest cavity longer from top to bottom. The diaphragm is the most important muscle of inspiration. Remember that. All right. So, when we're talking about air pressure, what happens is when I take a breath in, my lungs get bigger, my chest gets larger, and the pressure inside my lungs is much greater, okay? But when the pressure in my lungs is greater, the pressure in my thoracic cavity where my lungs are goes down, all right? And it has to be because if I kept the same amount of pressure in my thorax when I took more into my lungs, then I would pop something, all right? There's not room for everything. So as I take... In air, inside my lungs, the pressure rises, whereas inside my thoracic cavity, around my lungs, gets lower, all right? And then as I breathe out, then the pressure inside my lungs decrease, whereas the pressure inside my thoracic cavity goes up, all right? And then as I take a breath in, don't forget that when I take a breath in, 
it flattens out my diaphragm. And then when I'm at rest, my diaphragm goes back up into my thoracic cavity and is dome shaped. <coughs> <coughs> All right, I'm gonna stop this video and I'm gonna make a part two. And that way it won't take so long to upload. And we'll pick back up with, um, we'll go back and we'll talk a little bit more about expiration.